our work in the asset building program is really driven by a desire to broaden access to economic resources. And we really think about sort of increased savings. We think about sort of increased ownership as, as, as key goals. And, and we think about that not just because uh, you know, having more money is nice, but, but families that are more uh, economically secure, that are more financially stable, have a, they do better. They have a better shot at moving up the economic ladder in the long run. They have a greater stake in our society. Um, and we just, we see this really consistently across the research. Kids that grow up in families that are, that are low income, uh, but they're savers, have a much better chance of moving up the economic ladder than the same kid from the same household uh, with the same income level, but the family's not able to save. Um, kids that have savings for college are four, five, six times more likely to go to college than the same kid with the same expectations, but who doesn't have that savings account. So there's really a critical role for government to play in supporting sort of household economic stability and supporting the ability to save um, uh, across the long, the, the, the big picture. Um, and, and I think we've had a lot of talk about programs so far. I'm really glad that Johan mentioned one of his key areas for the administration in this focus is tax credits. Because really tax credits play the biggest role, I think, in supporting that development of, of family assets um, uh, in the long run. There's about a half a trillion dollars that goes out the door every year through the tax code to support families uh, uh, buying and owning a home, uh, support their retirement savings, support their education savings. The unfortunate thing is, is that that distribution of funds is really skewed and the vast majority of that money goes to families in the top 10, 20 percent of the income distribution. And there's really very little of this pro-savings support that goes to families in the bottom 50, 60 percent of the income distribution. Um, and so the effort is there, the will is there, the resources are there. It's just not always applied with care, uh, and it's not always targeted to the families uh, that need the most help, that are striving really for a better life. Um, but there are some key proposals in the president's budget that I think are moving us uh, in the right direction, um, and that are really closely related to the idea of promoting the financial stability of families, along with a more modern understanding of what a family is, as, as you and Shelley, I think, both eloquently said earlier. Uh, the first one, uh, one of the big sort of family supports that's out there is the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is uh, often called our largest uh, anti-poverty program uh, because of the sheer size of the dollars that are involved in the EITC. Um, and it really is. It's, it's really become, uh, as we've seen, other income supports uh, and programs really wither away over the course of the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, the EITC has really assumed a primary role in terms of where our policy for supporting families is. And what's nice about the EITC is uh, it's tied to work. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a substantial amount of money. Um, what's bad about the EITC uh, is that it only happens once a year and you get this sort of like balloon drop of money but also that it excludes um, a, a lot of people um, who are working, working hard, and who have really significant needs and are also connected to and a part of families. So the way the policy works now is that uh, uh, if you're um, a non-custodial parent or, or you're childless, uh, you're essentially not eligible for the EITC. There, there's a policy there and you can access it, but it maxes out at $500 and it and it fades out really quickly. So you don't have to make very much money to not be eligible for the EITC if you're technically not in care uh, of children. Um, but we've come to know and we've come to understand that a lot of people that we term to be non-custodial parents are deeply involved in the lives of their kids. They're a part of that village that Shelley talked about earlier. Um, they may not be physically in the household from a where the mail gets sent perspective, uh, but they are an integral part of the lives uh, of this next generation and they play a key role in, um, in, in determining how well those kids are going to do going forward. Uh, and so the administration put on the table a proposal to double the size of that tax credit uh, and make it more accessible 
uh, for non-custodial parents uh, and for childless workers um, at the bottom end of the income spectrum. The other thing that's sort of incredible about current policy is uh, there's an age exclusion. If you're age 21 to 24, you're, you're just sort of simply not eligible uh, for, the, for the childless portion of the EITC, and the administration's put on the table a proposal to end that exclusion. And, and I think really sort of what you, what you see there is it's, it just reflects a more holistic understanding of what a family is, who's in a family, and also this idea that Shelley said earlier, for our kids to do well, our families have to do well. You know, non-custodial parents, and I'll, I'll fall into the trap of saying dads, um, you know, have to pay child support, have to, have to make ends meet. Uh, they have to be financially stable and secure in order to do that. Excluding them from the nation's largest anti-poverty program um, is uh, penny-wise pound foolish, I think, is probably the, the key way to put that. The, the second part uh, of that conversation that I think is closely related, we've expanded the EITC and the child tax credit pretty significantly since the crash in 2008. This is a major part of, of money that's been spent through the tax code to help low and moderate income families over the course of the last uh, six, seven years. Um, that's, you know, we would like to think that that's sort of the new normal, these larger, larger amounts of funds that are out there to support families and the administration has proposed making those changes uh, permanent so you reach more families with more money. Um, there's no guarantee that that's gonna happen. Um, and we could, we could easily see uh, a slide back to uh, a smaller reach for those key supports, um, both in terms of who they reach uh, and the amount of money that's delivered. Uh, I think the administration's really on the right track in trying to uh, make those changes permanent. Folks have come to expect the EITC is going to be about a certain amount of money for them. Uh, life has not gotten a lot cheaper over the course of the last six, seven, eight years. Uh, if you let that, uh, those expansions go away, it'll be a long time till we get back to the level of support that we've come to expect the last couple of years. And then the last thing is a little bit different, but, but I think really critical. One of the things that we've seen out of the crash, I see Gene Hogarth from CFSI is here today. Um, CFSI has done some tremendous work along with a lot of other people. We've seen an explosion of research into what does the financial picture look like for ordinary American families. And we've learned a lot, I think, uh, about this and it's time to start applying those lessons. What we've learned about American families is there's not a lot of liquid assets sloshing around. Nobody has bags of money, right? If you're a middle, upper middle income family, the vast majority of your net worth is tied up in your home and you're very unlikely to have really significant amounts of resources that you can just easily move around when you need to. Don't even begin to talk about the bottom end of the income spectrum and what, uh, where debt is the, is the thing that characterizes those households much more so than any, any significant amount of net worth. After the house, the next thing that shows up on ordinary families' balance sheets is the retirement savings account. But we have a huge access problem when it comes to retirement savings. About half of families have no access to um, a, retirement, a retirement plan through their employer. Uh, that's something we can fix. The administration has proposed um, something called the automatic IRA uh, to fix that. That's a proposal that has bipartisan root, roots. Um, They've also proposed uh, making it easier for part-time workers to get into the company plan, which I think is a really positive change. And then the, the last thing that's happening is states see this retirement access gap and are starting to develop their own plans to bring you know, half to a third to a quarter of their workforce into the game on retirement savings. Um, and the administration has, has proposed a, a pot of money uh, to support the development of those kind of plans uh, across the country. And so I think we're really seeing some, some interesting and some innovative proposals that take a look at uh, you know, who the family is, let's support all the members of the family, and then also let's diversify the balance sheet a little bit so that uh, we're not so dependent on, on having all our eggs in one basket.